In terms of our walk in this life, you know, these songs captured so well. Uh, the last one where we come to the altar, and basically the song is come to the altar and stay there. <laughs> you come to the cross and stay there. And on one level, our life is in Christ, when we're invited to come in and join the dance, is one of coming and and staying, planting and remaining. And so much uh, of life is, uh, you know, just avoiding or or refocusing when we get distracted from things that are not, uh, that don't take us into that mindset and that that uh, uh, way of thinking and way of living. But there's another piece of that when you think about it. And if all we did between now and the time that we see Jesus as he is, if all we did was hang out at the altar, we would run the risk of having him say, you know, I expected, I mean, I gave you talents and all you did was hang out at my altar. You know, spiritually in my heart, I need to never depart that altar. But on a day-to-day basis, we also serve a God who, who, is, who is by nature, by his nature. He can't help it. He, that's something he can't help it. He just is, and it's wonderful that he is, by virtue of being love and by virtue of being power, he, is, he creates. And, and so he's not a stagnant God. He's a dynamic God. And he wants us to have a dynamic life. And so he orders our ways. He, 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 you know, it says that we can make plans, but it's God who, who orders our path. And he has, as Joel Osteen likes, likes to constantly refer to uh, becoming what God created you to be. And, and there's some truth to that. You know, God, God leads us by the, by the uh, still, you know, the, the still waters and the green pastures. And God leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. It's a very dynamic life. So with that in mind, and to try to kind of capture once in a while, you know, step back and capture the application of, who, of, of what happens on a daily basis as we live at the altar and as we live at the cross. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm tempted to ask, what, what is it that you want to become? But that's maybe not really the the right answer. It's uh, what is it that God wants us to become? Now, hopefully, those are really the same question. Uh, I know in in spirit, for me, it is. You know, when you when you ask me what what does what do you want to do? I, it's I think well, what is I want to do? What, I want to know what God wants me to do. I was having a conversation with someone who knows me quite well. We know each other, but we don't uh, we don't talk frequently. And so it had been, I don't know, six, at least six months. He'd been traveling. I'd, I'd been busy. And we got together. And he, at, toward the at t- at end of our time together, he, he said, you know, Randall, he said, I, I, he said, I just feel like I need to observe this. He said, I can't quite put my finger on it exactly. But he said, since we met last, he said, you've really changed. He said, you've changed a lot. And I said, oh. And he said, yeah. He said, there's a there's a there's a more subtleness about you and a more uh he said it seems uh, that there's a confidence and a uh and I just chuckled and I said yeah I said I can tell you basically I've almost point to the various dates and times because I said what's happened is God has given me clarity on what he wants me to do and I said in all this time I've I've wanted, I've I've known that I've been serving God I know I've been doing good things and you know and I uh, I, that's all fine, but I said there was this underlying frustration that says, "Lord, I, I can't." You know, it, to me, it doesn't seem like this is, this is it. This is, this is the convergence of all you've put in me, and and in a, you know, a logical outflow. And I said, um, "He's he's been giving me uh, clarity." I said, "Well, that's the whether it's the big picture or whether it's just one more piece." I said, "It's a much clearer piece." And I said, "I've that's probably what you're seeing." He said, "Yeah, I think it is." So regardless, you know, whether we say, what do you want to become uh, or what does God want you to become? uh, The real question we need to ask if we're going to be real about this is what do we need to do repeatedly in order to become 
whatever that is. Because otherwise, it's just a wish. And when we put faith into action, we start to work. We start to move. We start to serve. We start to speak. We start to read. We start to channel the, the, the things of life in a, accordingly. Think about the beginning of your normal day. I, I assume it's somewhat the same of mine, and there are exceptions. But normally, at least when you have the opportunity, uh, normally the beginning of my day is, is roughly the same pattern as the beginning of the previous day. And the day before that, and the day before that. The dog, even the dog knows it. <laughs> the dog knows when I get up, you know, she wants to be fed, and she kind of looks at me, sees what I'm wearing. She stands up, greets me, you know, wags. She's got to jump up and give me a lick on the chin. She didn't have to jump very high for that. And then she just kind of like, I hear this big, and she turns, she turns around and goes back and gets in your corner because she knows, oh, he's just getting up, and he's going to go out there, and he's going to turn on the kettle, and then he's going he's gonna to take his cup of tea, and he's going to go in that little room and shut me out, and I'm not going to see him for two hours. So she goes back to bed. When that door opens two hours later, she's up, wag, 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 because she knows, hey, he's going to feed me and let me out. And, it, and it's, you know, so even the dog knows how predictable I am in, in, my, in the beginning of the day when I'm able to do it. Like I said, there are those days where I have to go in with Susie at four o'clock or something. Uh, but, you know, when we, if you commute to work or if you, you know, you're shopping, grocery shopping. Uh, what do you guys shop? You shop at uh, Winco? There by you? No, uh, Dave and Barry. Oh, uh, Freddie, woohoo! Okay, where do you, where are you a? Uh, Freddie Winco Costco. Okay, so we got our patterns. You know, everybody, you go to the same things. You know, um, <clears throat> there was the research. Uh, it's getting about a decade old now, but at Duke University, um, that says that about 40% of the actions that the average person does daily, about 40% of the daily actions, are not the result of intentional decision making, but rather the result of habit. About 40%. So most of us have some goals. We have something we want, and and that's good. God, you know, God wants us. I mean, He gives us plenty of space within His will for us to uh, for us to choose and for us to have uh, desires that are good and things we pursue that are within. And actually, He incorporates them into His uh, plan and way He leads us. You know, I mean, I mean. There are those he calls to be celibate, possibly, like the Apostle Paul, or, or those who you know could be married. But typically, even a, a young man or young woman that, that grows up really wanting to serve God with all their heart, their whole life, uh, you know, they have a plan to get married and have a family. That, God's, God's cool with that. He wants that too. And he doesn't stop him from using us individually or as a family uh, to fulfill his will. So there's this interesting mixture of things that God specifically wants for us, and they especially would tend to fall in the category of character and uh, uh, that kind of thing. And then there's those, there's those plans and, and desires and goals that, that are ours in the sense that God delegates them and gives them to us, but they're also his in that he embraces us and them. So it's, it's kind of an interesting mixture. Um, the thing we need to know kind of take on board at the beginning is that goals and setting of goals do not determine success. They just don't. They're important, but the setting of goal is at the end of that process, when you have it all done, it's still a wish and nothing more. It is habits. It is habits that determine a successful outcome. And I, I was, I forget who I was listening to. Um, it was, it was, I think it was at the Christian Leadership Alliance Conference. Uh, somebody was giving the, the main, and they were talking about how ultimately when it comes to, to, you know, when God talks about how you fruit, by the fruits we, we're known, 
that it's the aggregate, it's the aggregate of our decisions over a lifetime that really determine what we believe. Not our wishes uh, or, in, or necessarily intent. So habits determine success. And as, I, as I've said over and over, and I want this to stay the focus of the rest of what I say, this is not about getting where we want to go or attaining our goals. It's about moving in the direction that God is leading us. It's about being in a position to respond and move successfully and arrive successfully. Being able to do that, again, is not based on wishes or goals or even identification of an, of an outcome. It is based on the things we do over and over and over in a little way that become a big way that determine success or failure. So in a very real spiritual sense, uh, uh, the, the issue of habit and how we live within that uh, is important to God. It's important to God. So uh, James Clear says, you, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. You don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And I know certainly that's true in my case, even though I would rather it were not. So when God wants to move uh, in our lives, he wants us to be in a position to say yes to him. Are we always? Think about it. Think about your life. Can I just do a little quick rewind? All the way back, have you been in a position either of capability internally or willingness to say yes to God when he has moved in your life in a certain direction at the time he asks? I wish I could say yes, but I know, but but I can cite, I can cite date, time, and place multiple times. Where, uh, looking back, I realized God was moving and wanted me to do X, and I either missed it, uh, deleted the message, <laughs> or did something that I justified as thinking it was good. You know, kind of like Cain did. Uh, you know, yeah, I'll give you a sacrifice, but uh, mine's going to be some uh, veggies. <laughs> My mind's vegan. <laughs> Maybe maybe Cain was the first vegan. Uh, so we need to when God you know kind of taps us on the shoulder and and says uh, I want you to move or respond to me in this way we need to be in a position to do so and I I think that this is also this is a very important area where where in our spiritual walk it's our systems. Um, I want to look at Dan, I want us to look at Daniel for a moment. Okay, how many of you in your career? At one and what one or more times have been promoted anybody anybody not okay um, how many of us have lost a, at some point have lost a friendship or damaged a friend had a friendship damaged I'm saying we did it but it, as a result of us being promoted have you you haven't that's cool I mean I've talked to some people who haven't but unfortunately the majority at some point it just tends to be feelings especially if there's more than one person feeling that they you know were in line for or deserve that promotion uh so this happened to daniel and it happened because god moved in his life just in the same way that he moves in ours and the thing is and this is where i want to focus on daniel a little bit is that daniel the thing is daniel was ready daniel was ready um, let's take a look at Daniel chapter 6. It says that uh, uh, Daniel, this is uh, verse 3, Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Now what was happening is that the king was looking for someone to promote as his, uh, basically uh, to run the empire as his COO of the empire. He wanted to be free to go out and conquer, which means you, in those days, you leave the capital and the throne for significant periods or maybe multiple years. You've got, I, f I forget now how many provinces and satraps, as they call them, uh, of conquered nations across the Middle East, across Asia, uh, up into Southern Europe that the Persian Empire or the Babylon Empire had uh, had conquered and was administering. And the king was looking for someone to give all of that to, 
that he could trust and that would do a good job. And so Daniel was part of a group of extremely educated, competent, and titled, respected people. He's with the Magi. They, so, so there were people there, you know, who had the equivalent of a Harvard education, you know. And you know how we, today, how those things all make, mean something, you know. So, oh, so you've got an MBA, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, where's your, where's your, oh, uh, well, my, my, uh, I, I was at Wharton. Oh, and all of a sudden it's, ooh, step back. This is not just a regular MBA, you know. Even in Washington, I mean, if it's UW versus Pierce County Community College, I mean, it's kind of like, oh, you know, oh okay. So there was the same kind of thing going on here. And these people were all, uh, you know, highly entitled. And so when Daniel, in terms of the king's uh, evaluation, that Daniel began was performing ahead of all the other administrators and high officers. Because Daniel's great ability, because of Daniel's great ability in, in this role of business, you know, the business and government, kind of, they were all kind of combined. He, he was in government, but he had, he had to run the business of the empire. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Okay, I mean, just let that soak in for a moment. And of course, where we're going with the story is how the other administrators became jealous and began trying to uh, take him down. And so if you were in Sunday school growing up through your whole life, or maybe YES or whatever version it was, we all know if I start out and say, Daniel and the, you know what to say. Yeah. This is all about Daniel ending up at the lion's den. But let's kind of let's kind of look at some of the things before he ends up in the lion's den, because uh, you might you know if, if, when you just read that verse you think well Daniel must have had an IQ of you know two twenty nine or two eighty he must have been Mensa he must you know and he must have. Uh, he, he must have had a photographic memory. He could suck up all this information and hold it. And what was it that made him so much better than all these other highly educated people? Well, it says right here, and it's what's fascinating is today in our business world, there is research that shows that these same things that we're going to read in, 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 the, in the moment are things that drive effectiveness of corporations and their profitability up through the roof. And that the companies that are flying highest and making the most money consistently over, over time, not just, a, not just a manipulation of the market, uh, are doing some of these things. So it wasn't just business knowledge that Daniel had. It says... Then the other administrators, verse 4, and high officers began searching for some fault in the way that Daniel was handling government affairs. But they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. Why? Because Daniel, over a long period of time, since he was a teenager, since he was a kid, had been one day at a time day after day, after day, after day, just doing these little things that over time became uh, defining, that became the defining difference that would cause an emperor to say, you rule over my empire instead of them. And those things that they, I'm sure there were more, but they names, it says they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful. You know, if you have a boss, if you have a CEO who's faithful, faithful to the public, it doesn't you know they don't lie to the public, faithful to the government, faithful to their product, faithful to their employees. My word, you're describing uh, something like Southwest Airlines, <laughs> who enjoy incredible profitability and incredible ratings, uh, satisfaction ratings in the market. He was always responsible. He, and completely trustworthy. 
These were the things that made the, that the king, that put, that put Daniel above. And every one of those was not a goal, it was a system. It was just a little thing. You know, <laughs> I, hate, I hate to even use this as an example because it's something I should have been doing since I was a kid. But uh, I, was stumbling, I stumbled across something on YouTube. Uh, it was a ranking uh, officer in the U.S. Army who was speaking at a uh, university graduation. I forget which one it was. It was one of the big, college, big universities back east. And for whatever reason, this speech really kind of went viral. It had, had like over a million views. And it was uh, had an intriguing title, something about uh, 10 things or seven things to uh, make your life successful, something like that. And I thought, oh, okay, I'm curious what his list is. So anyway, it was a great speech, about 17 minutes long. And but the first point he made was make your bed every day. It was, it was that simple. Make your bed every day. And then he unpacked that, talking about why they why they require the recruits uh, and soldiers to first thing they you know at Reveille out of bed, their feet at the floor, they make their bed and they make it to a high standard. You know, it's all the, all the kind of stuff, the corners and all that. And he, uh, he, and then he went on. He, he said, "You know, this isn't just to, uh, this isn't just to be picky or to make their life difficult." He said, "It's beginning to instill something," and he li started listing off, started listing off little things that, that that little act of getting out of bed and making it did for you for the rest of your day, which repeated over and over and over, changed your life. And it went so far as to say, uh, I, I remember his last point. Uh, because there have been a few days where I've, I've experienced it. He said, and you know, if nothing else, at the end, he said, at the end of a day where things really went bad, <laughs> he said, and, or he said, you're just really feeling terrible, and you, you go to bed and you walk in and there's a crisp made bed to get into, he said, it just makes, you know, getting over it a little easier. And I thought, yeah, even that's true. Anyway, so now... I make my bed, my feet hit the floor, uh, except yesterday when the cat has got hairballs and evidently he chose right where my feet hit to, to launch them. And so I hit the floor and immediately left the room. <laughs> so I didn't, that's my first day off. But anyway, now I'm, I make the bed, you know, um, unless Susie's in it, uh, every day. And it does make a difference. And it's now a habit. It's now, in fact, I... It was only a few minutes I was out of the bedroom. I hadn't even gotten fully dressed, and I thought, you know, don't 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 let that don't let those that cat, you know, stuff bother you. Don't let that stop you from doing what you should do. So get in and make that bed. So I did. I went back in, and I made it a little extra nice, uh, just to kind of compensate because because it was a habit now. But it was one stupid little thing, and has it made a difference? Yeah, I should probably go back and watch the speech again and move on to the next thing he said to do because if it was as simple yet helpful as the first thing, why not? And that's kind of the point I'm, I'm leaning toward is how we, how, we start, how we start building these habits and systems in the areas where, we, where they don't already exist. Uh, we'll, and we'll come to that a little bit later. But I, just, I wanted us to just really capture the fact that it was these simple day-by-day -day things that Daniel did that were of a, of a, of a spiritual habit that set him apart in the business world and the government world from the rest of the rest of the pack who were equally or even more educated than he was. So it was interesting. They said in verse five, they couldn't find the anything because he was faithful, always responsible, completely trustworthy. Verse five. So they concluded our only chance for finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. Verse 10. But when Daniel, so, so you know the story, the, the king passed, they got the king to pass a law saying, you can't pray to anybody but the king. Knowing that this would, this would get Daniel in trouble because they knew Daniel had a habit, day by day, of praying to God. And, he wasn't, and, they, they, and they assumed, rightfully, verse 10, when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, <laughs> he went back home and he knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem, and he prayed three times a day, just as he had always done. 
giving thanks to God. So these, these, these people who wanted, who wanted to take him down knew he had a habit. And Daniel, uh, learning that they, were, that they were testing that, you know, Daniel was not in his creation any different than us. Yes, you know, when God puts you into a role that big, he probably gives you a bit more support and that kind of thing than, than you would need otherwise. Uh, even that, I'm not sure, is, a, is a, anywhere near a valid statement. Sounds, sounds untrue to me when I hear it in my ears. But be that as it may, you know, God had this, uh, Daniel had the support for doing what the commission that God gave him from God. Yes, that's true. But Daniel, <clears throat> Daniel had acted in ways that over, in other words, his confidence was high. If he did not have that habit, you know, it's like, oh boy, well, I know I need to pray, and I do pray sometimes. Maybe I should miss some just till this, till this, get a time to talk the king out of that. Uh, you know, and they get this wavering, and well, okay, and maybe, you know, gulp, and God help me, help me, help me, you know, hope I survive this. Daniel didn't have any of that, he didn't need it. It was so much a part of his life and his faith that he recognized, he recognized immediately the test that was there. And he knew exactly how to respond, which was the way I always serve God doesn't change. And, and it, it, you know, I won't say it was easy. He probably knelt down that first time knowing, well, this is going to be a really interesting ride, Lord, uh, you know. Maybe you're finished with me, in which case uh, I never thought of going down as lion food, but, uh, uh, you know, if you're not, this will be an interesting ride. Uh, maybe. I mean, he's, he's human. But as far as, as far as knowing what to do, knowing how to respond in, in, in line with God's mission and will for him, no question, and comparatively speaking, no problem. So... Uh, you know, Daniel had a habit in place, and he was ready. Uh, it's amazing how little, how few of us are are really ready. Sports Illustrated published uh, some statistics that really shocked me. Their research showed that 78% of NFL players, National Football League football players, are bankrupt or in financial stress within two years of leaving their sport. 78%. Uh, the NBA, far less, uh, I think is more settled and maybe higher education, I don't know. But the NBA, 60% of NBA players go bankrupt within five years after leaving their sport. Well, part of God's pathway is to bless us and to free us if we need to be freed from things that are that are holding us back or things that are causing us to not be able to live at the cross or at the altar you know sometimes god's god's particular uh, where he wants us to move that toward with him and follow him is towards something and sometimes it's away from something but either way uh it, they often more often than not, involve living in a patterned way. You know, this friend that said, uh, and I, when I, hang on a moment. This friend that said, you know, you, you look different. And I explained why. I could have also gone on and explained to him how, um, how my daily activities have changed or are changing, have changed and are changing and will change to flow away from and into. And frankly, maybe that, maybe this, I hope this sermon is, is resonating to you. And it could be that I just needed to say it out loud because it needs to resonate with me and you got to listen, <laughs> whichever it is. If it's the latter, thank you. If it's the former, then I'm glad we're able to benefit together. But I know that for me to move in, in follow the lead of the Holy Spirit, as God is doing it in my life now, I must change. I must shift in my daily life. I must shift some thinking. I must drop some thinking. I must, I must take some thinking that has not been a part and make it to where it is like Daniel, just second nature. It, that means changing things about my daily schedule. 
I mean, there's a lot of that, and it's got to be systematized because the goals that God has put in my mind are just wishes. And they can just as easily be say something that at the end of my life or when I see Jesus, if he returns first, you know, it's like, well, well you know, I really wanted to. And I was, I was really thinking about it and work, you know, kind of was working on it. Well, yeah, Randall, but, you know, you, were, you had your start of the day and your walk through the day and the end of the day looked, looked at the end of your life just like it did before I gave you the, before, I, you know, before I began to move. I didn't see any shifting away from the things that were not becoming, I mean, not in, not uh, uh, helpful or building toward what I want, and it just continued. So where was the growth? I needed you to, I needed you to move from where you were. Like I wanted Abraham to get out of that city and follow me, even though he didn't know where it was going to end up, you know? So... Uh, that that's that's a part of all of our lives at one time, or and not just one time, multiple times. And I don't know if right now, if you're in just a kind of a, st- a green grass, still water uh, point of, of rest and relaxation, which if so, oh, wonderful. They do happen. They're wonderful. Uh, I'm not jealous, but I, but you know, but it's really cool. I'll, maybe I can come swim in your pool, <laughs> your, your, your still waters with you. But if not, you know, Sometimes we're not necessarily in the valley of the shadow of death, but we are on the march. And if so, it involves living, it involves doing, it involves the system. As as Luke 16 says, um, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. And if you're untrustworthy, about worldly wealth, then who will trust you with the true riches of heaven? And if you're not faithful with other people's things, why should you be trusted with things of your own? So the principle of, of, of little uh, confirming great is, is very valid. So just in the few minutes that uh, we have left, let me, let's just talk a little bit practical, okay, about how do we go about, uh, how do we go about starting and creating and um, actually in a way that brings about, so we look back, like I'm able to look back now and say, you know what, it's kind of just a, it's just a habit, it's just the way I do things, just to feet hit the floor and turn around and make the bed. Uh, but in a much bigger issue, in a way that's, it, that's kingdom, you know, mission important, mission critical, kingdom related. Um <clears throat> That's where we need to focus. Well, what's there's you know there's a, a really good book by called Atomic. Uh, is that called Atomic Habits? Uh, and he, he has a couple of good. I mean, this is nothing new, but uh, I think they're helpful to just kind of think of them as a package, and then put that package together with where God is moving in your life, or where you can see you need to move toward Him. Uh, either towards something or away from something. Uh, how do we go about actually doing that? Because you know, every New Year's people uh, uh, people make their resolutions, but by the end of January or certainly no later than March, statistically most of them are, are actually forgotten, let alone not acted on. In fact, the whole health club industry relies on the fact that we are terrible about uh, about about changing habits. And so they oversell at the holiday season all these gift club memberships. And so if ever you'll find, you know, if you belong to like LA Fitness or something, man, for about the first two to three weeks in January, that place is packed, just a zoo. But by the, by the middle of February, it's right back to the same old guys and, and, and girls and the same time and same kind of stuff. And and they rely on that because they get to keep those uh, those initiation fees and. Whatever, if there's a contract, you know that's where they make their money by people who, who pay but don't show up and use it. Anyway, uh, so how do we go about it? Well, f- the first thing that would help us is uh, for, obviously to identify a need and then to think through, okay, uh, what do I need to do? And the, and make and the, the point though is make it obvious when you figure out what's that. One small thing. Don't try to, you know, this is what I tended to do because I'm a big picture person. So, okay, uh, Lord, I know you want me to, you know, I, I shouldn't be this. I need to overcome that. Or 
I, I don't have this spiritual discipline deeply enough in my life. I need to grow into that. And so I, I do a little SWOT analysis and I do a little strategic planning and I list all the things that need to be done and, and, and I envision what it's like when I'm there. And then I try to, I try to act on them all at once. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, I need to pray more. I need to study the Bible more. Okay, so starting whatever, I have, I'll go from the time I am now to I'll double that amount of time per day. Uh, let's see, I need to, uh, yeah, I need to, I need to read all the material on the new material as it comes out on the on the website. Uh, let's see. I need to uh, whew, Bible in a year. Okay, four and a half chapters a day, and I make my list. and And then starting on Monday, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna grow in this area, and I'm trying to do all these things every day. And I, I don't even realize when I've stopped, but inevitably I have lost uh, lost gas. And I realize now, with the help of of uh, this author, don't do that. Just do one thing. One little thing that maybe it's the most critical thing, maybe it's not. Maybe it's the only thing you are sure you can probably do. Okay, do that. Based on what you want to become or based on what you, where you feel the Lord wants you to become, what one habit do you need to start? You know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's writing a card to someone. Maybe that's where you want to where you want to start. You don't make a big goal. You just take one card, and and if you can't do it a day, make it a week. One card a week to someone, a little card of encouragement that's handwritten, and you jump through the hoop of you know if you didn't buy them in a pack of 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 getting the envelope and then the stamps. You know who knows where stamps are nowadays? Actually, I'm the only one in our house that knows because I hit them. Cause, <laughs> um, Maybe it's uh, maybe if you're like me and and uh, you know you're trying to write write a, a book or or some write something down of substance, um, and and you know I I hate to admit with my last words I wrote on my manuscript. I mean I've I've got this block and I just kind of, but you don't do that. You say okay, two hundred words a day. You write that. You write much more than that every day anyway. Two hundred words. That's all. And if you can't do that, a hundred words. Okay, do that. I can, you know, I can pull these covers, the sheet, and throw this pillow, get it off the floor, and put it back on here. And I mean, yeah, that only took me. That took me about a minute, minute and a half. So whatever the words are, um, maybe it's exercise. Okay, I'm gonna join the club. I'm gonna lose sixty pounds. I'm gonna, you know, no, no, do that, do that. Uh, maybe it's one push-up, <laughs> or as Dave Goffles, who is really incredible as a coach and and a rehab kind of person he said he said randall just hey, look he said just start uh this is one of my other attempts at, at improvement that started and failed but dave gave me great advice he says don't, don't try to he said just think of in terms of footfalls and he says footfalls yeah two footfalls three footfalls four foot and he said start with 10 footfalls <laughs> i said 10 steps he said yeah he said, that's a great daily goal for first. He said, 10 foot falls. And he said, then the next day, add one. I said, only one? I said, it seemed like, you know, you'd be able to go from like 10 to 15 or maybe 10 to 20. I said, that's nothing. He said, I know. But he said, you know, you know what, he, what he was doing was encouraging me not to, not to elevate it to where it got to be a place where you tend to drop it. But 10, well, I can do 10. And just, it's, no, it's no burden. Okay, break it down to that level. You know, uh, show gratitude. If that's something, you know, because gratitude is so important in keeping a spiritual, uh, a sound spiritual mind and, and, and faith in place. Uh, so maybe we recognize that as something we need to grow into. All right, then maybe it's, uh, I'm going to say thank you intentionally to someone, specifically as part of this, not just, not just the normal at the grocery store, but I'm going to really, I'm going to thank somebody intentionally and specifically Every day. I've got one of my growth things, and I, I'm ashamed to say that I, that I need it. It should be, should be something that is just second nature for years now, but it's something I'm going to build into. And that is that my day, every day, my day is planned the day before. 
You'd think, you know, and most of well, the guys I work with, I see their calendars and like their their month is planned. Their six month out is, I mean, you hardly see any gaps. They've got all meetings and this and that. And they know what they're doing three or four months out. All right, I'm a little less disciplined. So I will start with tomorrow will be planned before I go to bed tonight. And the next day, the next day, and then I and then I intend to move it to two days and arrive eventually at a week and then build out from there until at least a month. And it'll be, it's so cool, it's so helpful to, to have that, you know. Uh, it, it's helpful personally, it's helpful in serving God to be a little more thoughtful than sometimes I get, I get more reactive. So there's, I could go on and on and on, but, but uh, you know, this is what, this just start small and make it meaningful. And you know, one other thing just to throw in there, if you have this problem, stop telling yourself. Stop that internal, like if it's patience, you're trying to build patience, and you're going to set a goal for that. Stop this, I, oh, you know, I'm just not a patient person. I've got to stop saying, oh, yeah, I just, uh, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not all that organized a guy. I mean, you know, some people, there's nothing on their desk, and other people, you know, but the higher their desk is piled, the, the more effective they think they are. Well, I'm one of those guys. But I but I got to stop being one of those guys, and one of the things I've got to do is stop saying, "Oh yeah, I'm not." Yeah, man, you should see my desk, you know, with a laugh. Uh, and and if you're, you know, whatever it is, oh yeah, I got to lose some weight. Well, you know, I'm just one of these. Don't do that. Stop that. Number two, make building a system in your life attractive. Make it attractive. Pair an action that you want to grow into with an action that you don't need to, but you really enjoy and love. That kind of stands on its own. I don't need to elaborate that one very much, do I? And thirdly, make it easy. We could say 3.3a, or we could say 4, if you wish. <laughs> make it small. Oftentimes, it's the size of the chunk that's that's really the issue as much that makes it hard or easy. And so make it easy. Make one turn into two and two turn into three. And you know, the more disciplined that we live in these ways, the more confidence God gives us. And that's what made the difference for Daniel. Daniel was ready to go because he had, he had ordered his life in a way that he allowed God to just Pour confidence into him. The more and 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 like Daniel, it it with it, with us, the f- the faith building confidence will become part of the fabric of our lives. And folks, I think we're going to need that going forward. In our in our walk with the Lord in this world. So, uh, I want to I want us to consider. Is uh, Zechariah, who says, and let's see, this is, uh, where was that? Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 10. Zechariah says, do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see work begin. That's really cool. God rejoices. I mean, he, he, he lights up. He likes it. To see us begin, he he doesn't he probably doesn't light up as much, but he understands. He's empathetic when we fall off the wagon, but when we pick ourselves up, make it small, make it doable, seek his help, and start out. It delights him. It delights God. So I'm not successful. I don't consider myself successful when I hit my goal for something somewhere in the future. But I feel that I am successful when I am faithful to God today. When I make my bed today, I'm successful. If I look back and say, you know what? Like, this is the first time I've actually looked back and said anything. I mean, I I thought it sounds like I'm making a big deal and real proud of myself, but it's actually, I just now realize it's been quite a while, and I, I could actually almost call that a habit now. I think it's a habit I could lose pretty easily. So it's not one I can just let go and say it's second nature like Daniel was yet, but it will be. 
And uh, I'm at the point now where, where you know, I, I, I don't feel good if I don't. I go back and do it, even if I, so that's, that, you know, that's cool. And it's, the, it's doing it today that brings me to that point. So that's success. When we, when, we, when we perceive or God helps us to see the path he wants us to move along, yeah, we identify that outcome. And we say, whew, I'm gonna, you know, I gotta follow him, and that means doing some stuff. And we start we start seeing what's in the way or what we need to add, and we take those little pieces and we make it attractive and and we and we do it today. We're successful. That is success. So may God bless the hearing and the reading of his word and cause it to kind of roll around and ruminate and and uh sometime you're whatever you're doing and whether it's in the garden or, or cooking or before you go to sleep and some little idea pops up, may he cause many of those to happen and really, uh, really build our faith through this uh, ordering of our lives in his way.